Amen. Thank you guys for leading us uh, this evening. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, uh, to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. The Old Testament book of 2 uh, Chronicles is where our text is going to be uh, this evening. If you're having a hard time finding that, uh, go to 1 Chronicles and go to the right. Okay? That'll help somebody, okay? Um, and, and so, it's on uh, page 408. Um, I don't know if that'll help anybody or not, but... I, uh, I, boy, I'm, I'm excited about being back with you tonight. I'm thankful that you're here. Uh, ha, matter of fact, how many, raise your hand if you are here. Okay, that's, that's good. You know, it's good to be there where you are. I, I really mean it. I mean, there, there's some times that we're there, but we're not there. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, m- my body's there, but my mind is, is not there. Um, my, my, my spirit is not there. I want to be somewhere else. And uh, I, I've, I've experienced that a lot in church. And I told you I was raised in church 21 years of my life. We, we just didn't miss. We were the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, if there was a special night, we went. If there was revival, we went. Uh, they, I mean, we was always in church. And for the biggest majority of it, I didn't want to be there. But I got saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I love, anyway, I'm, all right. I'm going to try to keep myself calm. All right, so um, 2 Chronicles 29. Did y'all find it? Did you get it, did you get it discovered in there? Um, 2 Chronicles 29. If you found it, say amen. amen. The Bible says Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother... Her name was Abijah and the daughter of Zechariah. And he, this is talking back about Hezekiah, did, did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square. And he, he said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from the holy place for our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord our God they have forsaken him have turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and they turned their backs on him they have also shut up the doors of the vestibule put out the lamps, and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, therefore the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, and He has given them up to trouble, to desolation, and to jeering, as you see with your eyes. For indeed, because of this, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our daughters, or our, 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 and our sons, our daughters, and our wives are in captivity. And verse 10 says, And now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that His fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him, to serve Him, and that you should minister to Him and burn incense lord might it be tonight that we'd experience a revival oh god i know i need revival i i i know that there are just moments in time in my life that lord that i get i get dry and times whenever i i I lose my joy and times where i lose my way and 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 church and Lord, if I'm honest, even sometimes my walk with you just gets quite mundane. I, it gets neglected. It gets set backwards in priority. Lord, I know our churches struggle with the same. And I pray tonight, Lord, that we'd get honest enough, desperate enough, that we would, Lord, cry out once again that you'd rend the heavens and pour out revival upon your people. 
Lord, only you can do it. I can't do that. I can't deliver that. But I believe you can. And I believe you want to even more than we want to experience it. So in this place, in this hour, with these people, oh God, my prayer, send a revival. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. Well, back in the 90s, early 90s, there was a somewhat of a penniless comedian became a multi-millionaire. He did so through making a statement that went something like this. You might be a redneck. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Oh, Jeff Foxworthy. Wasn't he a mess? And he would just, he would make statements about supposed rednecks like, if you and your father walk to school every day because you're in the same grade, you might be a redneck. Another one that I, I like because my, my daddy was a, a, a little bit of a hoarder and, and that gene is strong in my family. Uh, right now, my, my bride and I, uh, we really very unexpectedly a few weeks ago sold our farm. Uh, we've lived on that farm for 13 years, and when you live on a farm, you collect farm stuff, right? I didn't say good stuff, I just said stuff. Well, we weren't planning on this. This happened in about a 24, 48 hour period. Just boom, hey, it's sold. We weren't trying, a guy just called us. And so we've got a rent house we're moving to, but now I've got this 40 by 60 shop building and a 40 by 50 horse barn full of just stuff, right? Just, just stuff. And I don't know what to do with all it because I'm moving to a place that don't have any barn, okay? And, and so I can relate with this next one where he'd say that if people are constantly coming to your house to attend the garage sale that you're not having, you might be a redneck. Well, I want to capture that just a little bit, that you might statement. Uh, and, and I want to make some suggestions. It, it, here's, here's one of the things that just gives me a ton of freedom as a preacher, especially as a revival preacher. There's a lot of folks who have a really bad understanding of revival, and so I want to try to help us with that a little bit, that, that well, if we get that right guy, you know, he'll come in and he'll bring revival with him, and he'll just kind of sprinkle it on us like some kind of Jesus pixie dust or something and I just don't have that okay I maybe brother Vern does and he's just not told me how to do it I don't have it I'm just telling you, he doesn't have it either it's a work of the Holy Spirit and it, it, it freed me up a, a lot of years ago to understand this simple truth that your decision about obeying the Lord your decision about living by faith is not contingent upon me I, I can't do I can't even convict you my job as a, as a preacher, as an evangelist, or I, I really kind of think of myself more as a revivalist than an evangelist, but it, it is to share truth and then get out of the way and let the Spirit of God do what the Spirit of God can do. You see, the things that man does are temporal, but the thing that the Spirit of God does is eternal. You see, if you were looking for an amen spot, you missed a good one right there. What God does is eternal. It's, it's just the way it is. The stuff you and I do, it fades away like a flower. But what God comes and does, what He did in my heart, is an eternal work. So I want to I capture that. You might statement and make some suggestions. I'm going to just let the Spirit of God fill in the blank for you tonight, and you decide what you do with it. So I want to make a suggestion like this. You might need revival. Now I'm going to be so bold to tell you, oh, you need it. I, again, I, I, I don't have that ability to look into your soul, pull it out. and Boy, if I did, it'd be a whole lot different. Y'all be lined up right here and we'll, you know, be like duck, duck, goose. Get her out of here. You see, you know, that, that's just not who I am. I, I, don't have, I don't have, nobody else has that either, by the way. He's like, well, we should have got it. You no. Know. But I want to walk, and I love this story. Um, walk through and, and, and through this passage kind of make some suggestions about the need for a revival. Now I want to catch you up a little bit because some of you may not have done your morning devotion here in Second Chronicles 29. What's happened? 
Israel's a mess. By the way, this wasn't a new thing for Israel. They kind of lived in that world of being a mess. Uh, things got really good for them. They lived in days of plenty, and they couldn't handle success. And so anytime success came along, they wandered away. And then God brings about pain, and He allows them to suffer. They get desperate. They cry out to the Lord, and God revives them. There's re revival's not just a New Testament principle. Revival's all throughout the book, right? And, and by the way, aren't you thankful we fixed all that because we handle success so well? Are we not in the same... I mean, because I hear people all the time picking them, all oh, them... Those Israelites, they just couldn't get it. They were Baptists. This is... You go back just a couple kings earlier. And that, by the way, that's kind of how they did time in these days. It's in the days of the kings. The kings came along. And I loved how God in his book just sums... I just cuts to the chase. He sums it up. In 26, we learn about King Uzziah. He was 16 years old when he made king. Uh, by the way, think about that, being king at 16 years old. I mean, goodness. But here's how the Bible sums up these guys' life. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. We didn't get into all these exploits. Well, he built this. His church budget grew by 13%. He led the state in evangelism and baptisms. No, no, no. It was just he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, poor old Uzziah, he couldn't stay right. He didn't end all that well. He kind of, you know, had some blunders there toward the end. Then comes along uh, Jotham, and, and, and he reigns. In, he's 25 years old when he comes up. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Then comes Ahaz. Ahaz was a punk. He was no good. Ahaz was a wicked king. He, he, he did that which was not right in the sight of the Lord. He, he, he just did a lot of things. As a result of this, it's kind of summed up in verse 19 of tw chapter 28. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had encouraged the moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Let me declare something to you. Yes, even on this side of the cross, even under grace, there is still consequences when we sin. Now granted, I'm not talking about heaven or hell. My sin's been paid for. And I am so thankful at the cross of Calvary. When Jesus hangs there with his arms stretched out wide and he yells to tell us die, it is finished. Hey, he has declared that my work here is completed. My sins will... Oh boy, that make a man happy. I'll, I won't stand before him in judgment one day and him say, hey... Tell me about that. No, no, no. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm... If y'all were Pentecostal, you'd already fell out on the floor. You might need revival, because now here comes King Hezekiah. He's, he's a good boy. He's different. One of the best kings that Israel had. Some would say the best. This side of David. You might need revival if church is no longer a celebration. You might need revival if church is no longer a celebration. It was said earlier by this sweet gal that was testifying. I loved her testimony. She got talking about revival. About revival being for the church. And it, by the way, that is. Often, here's what we do with revival... We treat it like it's a, a, uh, a crusade where we want to see lost people saved and we can't figure out why they're not getting saved. Well, number one, probably because you didn't invite them. Number two, because we won't come up to the altar and pray. I, I'm just telling you, why would lost people do what the church quit doing? There, there should ne Listen to me. This is free. I hadn't planned on saying this. There should never be... A service where your pastor or any preacher stands up, gives an invitation. As long as there's lost people in our communities, that the altar should not be jam-packed full of broken-hearted people crying out to God, begging Him for souls.
I'm trying. Hezekiah becomes king. And in verse 3, it says in the first year of his reign, in the first month, translation immediately, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. That was priority number one. Let me, let me put that in our context. We're going back to church. Enough of this that we've got the, the church house closed up. Enough of this that it's no longer a priority. Enough of this that we've got things closed down. Hey, the church has got to get back together. It's one of the reasons COVID has been such a struggle for us is because we're trying to do church through a computer screen. And God bless all of those of you that are watching by computer screen tonight. But let me just be abundantly clear with you. The church was not designed to be distant. We need community. We need community. Now let me tell you what I didn't do, okay, because I got you all worked up, didn't I? Let me tell you what I didn't do. I'm not saying to a dear brother or sister at home that has some immunocompromised situations that, hey, you're in sin to not be. It's not at all what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you this, the church is never going to be what it was designed to be through a computer. It's not. I praise God for computers. We've been doing live streaming at our church for years and years. I'm thankful for technology. We have access to so many people. I tell our folks, there could be billions of people watching us right now. There's not, but there could be. I mean, if they wanted to. But we need each other. But here's what's happening. Stay with me. What's happening is church has just become a thing. It's just become an option. It's, I'm amazed at how little it takes for us to just excuse church. I have people that will have a... They don't come to church. Man, where were you yesterday? Oh, man, preacher... Saturday was... I didn't ask about Saturday. Yeah, but oh, we had a long day. So. Long day Saturday, huh? Well, here's one. I love this one. Well, we're not going to be at church Sunday, preacher. Well, why not? Well, we've got some family in. We've got a new program at our church. We let families come. Okay? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, it just, it caught me as I'm reading the text. In the first year, in the first month, Hezekiah didn't get together and say, hey, we need, we need to talk about our retirement. He didn't say, hey, boys, tell you what, let me tell you what's going to really get us together. Let's go down and start a new chariot racing club down there at the wall. Let's, let's go down and do that. He didn't say, hey, boys, I'm, I'm telling you what, we need, we, we, let's, let's have us a potluck. He, and I'm for potlucks, amen. Immediately, Hezekiah's like, we're going back to church. Church, church should, and when I'm talking about church, so you'll understand, I'm not just talking about a building, I'm talking about the gathered body of Christ. That should be one of the most longed for and protected things in your life as a believer. You say, well, why do you say that? Has it always been that way for you since I've been saved? And I keep coming back to that. I'm telling you, it, it all changed for me when I got saved. Church was no longer... My mama and my bride were the only two reasons I went to church for a number of years. It was so much easier to come and sit and listen to that preacher holler and scream and spit and had that vein pop out on his neck than, than to listen to them two women nag me every week. You need to get in church. You need to be able to church. Bless God, you're not going to make it in church. Church, 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 church. I'm like, I'll go to church. But when I got saved, can, listen to me now. Lean in, don't miss this. When I got saved, nobody, I'm talking nobody has had to ask me to come to church anymore. Nobody said, make this a priority, please. Nobody's had to offer me a new car or, or cookies or nobody. And I'm fine with all that. If y'all got any. I, because of the Spirit of God in me, have a desire, a longing, an excitement in me about the church. My daddy taught me to be a churchman. That's one of the things that he, 
he, uh, I, I just picked up from him. And it wasn't it sat down, and here's the lecture, son. You're going to be a church. No, no, no. I just watched my dad's life. You, parents, don't, don't, don't miss how much of an influence you have in your kid's life by just living life. My dad was committed to the local church. A few years ago, uh, my youngest son, uh, who's now a, a, a freshman in college at Northeastern State University, he, uh, he, he got on a, a soccer team. And I don't know why anybody wanted to be on a soccer team, but he got on a soccer team. I didn't know anything about it. I mean, it's, it's the craziest sport that there ever was. I mean, you, you get, you know, like penalized for running faster than the other team. It, it's crazy. And, and, and we've got some soccer fanatics. I mean, rabid fanatics down there. And they're all, but I'd never been to a soccer game. And just was never my thing. I didn't, we, we just made fun of soccer people where I come from. But, but now it's a big deal. And so he gets on this soccer team. Well, I'm going to go participate in this thing, right? I want to go cheer him on. Well, I don't even know what to yell whenever you go to a soccer game. Because I'm out there going, hit him, tackle him, you know. And well, I found out you can't say that. And, and, and so... Then they, they, they run into one of our boys and knocked him down. And so I'm like, okay, they've got referees. I know how to do it. You yell at a referee. That should be a pastime. And so I'm like, throw your flag, ref. I'm screaming, throw your flag. And it's, it's the lady ref. She stops the whole game, y'all. And she runs all the way over here to Pastor Chad. She stands in front of him all just, you know, proper. Sir, we don't throw our flags. We raise them. I said, well, raise your flag. He ran over our boys. Well, I found out not long after he got in this soccer thing that the big deal with these soccer things are tournaments. Now, I know y'all don't have any of these issues up here, but down where we are, all those tournaments are on the weekend. They're on Sundays. So the coach comes and tells us, he said, well, we've got a tournament coming up and it's going to be a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I said, hey, coach. I said, I ain't. And I did this away. I didn't do this in front of everybody. It wasn't grandstanding. I said, hey, coach, man, I, I'm, I'm, you know, we're pretty to let our boy play. And if this is going to be a problem, that's okay. We'll just, you know, we'll deal with it. But I said, we'll be at all the tournaments that we can be at. But I said, we won't be able to play on Sundays. We won't be able to play on Sundays. Oh, well, why? I, I said, well, um, we go to church on Sunday. And, and he said, and, and about this time a lady walks up and says, oh, he's a preacher, that's why, oh, no, 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 no. It's not because I'm a, I'm a Christian. That, that's why we're not going to be at your soccer games on Sunday, because we're Christians. It's the day we've set aside to gather as the body and, and, and worship the Lord together. It was a big deal to us. And guess how many times we had to battle that? Every single tournament. We do well on Friday, we do well on Saturday, and it's on our way out. Because coach had a short memory. Uh, Lord bless his heart. He's like, see you tomorrow. And I'm like, sorry coach, we won't make it. And constant, oh yeah, you're a preacher. No, no, like don't, don't muddy the waters here coach. I'm not missing because I'm a pastor. I'm missing because I'm a Christian. And by the, that doesn't make me better than anybody else that missed the game. I get that. My point in saying it is, if it's not a priority for you mom and dad, if church is not that thing you long for, that thing you're excited about, if it's no longer a celebration, you probably, you might need revival. Because here's what's going to happen. It won't be a priority, and it won't be a celebration for little Bobby, or whatever that kid's name is. You see, the things that you're passionate about and you celebrate, your kids pick up on. It's amazing to me how we want to change the game when it comes to church. I'll hear Christian parents, church member parents talk about, well, we want them to just, you know, make their own decisions. Or you, I didn't get to have an opinion until I was 16 years old. My boys, pray for them, both of them. My boys are diehard Arkansas Razorbacks. And Los Angeles Lakers fans. Die hard. There's no earthly reason for anybody in the Midwest to be a Los Angeles Lakers fan. No, no reason. You want to know why they are? Their daddy is. 
lifelong. I was a Magic Johnson guy back in the 80s and Showtime. Oh, come on. I'd never sit down and said, now, boys, listen. Let me tell you who your team's going to be. Uh-uh. You know how they picked up on that? They saw old dad passionate about watching those Laker games. Same with the Hogs. Boys, you want to talk about have to have some thick skin to be a Hogs fan. It's rough. You see, my point in all that is they pick up on what we're passionate about. Mom and Dad, if you're not passionate about it, if church, you're looking for excuses to miss church, it's no longer a celebration, it's not a priority, please, 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 at least stop coming to the pastor when they fall off stupid and you're wondering why. Own it. Own it. We set the temperature in our homes spiritually by what we're passionate about. I'm just saying this, this ought to be a, this should be a respite. This should be a time when life has just kicked you in the teeth. Anybody had life kind of kick you in the teeth? Amen. 2020, okay? Coming here ought to be that thing that we're just saying, oh, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. Because we're going to come in there, hey, the music may not be what I want. The chairs may not be what I want. I'm more of a pew guy. Uh, the, 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 uh, you don't even have carpet, so I can't even gripe about that except for I'm griping about you don't have carpet. Set all that aside, I'm just excited to be in the house of God with the people of God on the day of God preaching the Word of God for the glory of God. <laughs> Holy smoke, that took a long time. Move on to the next one. You might need revival if you've become outwardly faithful but inwardly filthy. Verse 4 then he brought the priests and the Levites. He gathered them in the east square. Now mind you, he's just opened up the doors. He's just said, we're going to come back and deal with it. And he said to them, hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord. God of your fathers, carry out the rubbish from the holy place. For our fathers, they trespassed and done evil in the eyes of the Lord their God. They forsook him and they've turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord. Turned their backs on him. You see, what is happening here is Hezekiah is saying we're going to have to deal with sin if we're going to get back to worship. You see, that's one of the reasons that we do worship is because we have a problem. We've got a problem with sin that has to be dealt with. Now, some of you may come back at me and say, well, hang on now, we're under grace. We don't have to deal with sin anymore. Did you stop? Now, I understand it's all paid for. It. I get all that. It's, it's completed. But I just say this, just total transparency. I know this will shock you. I did not stop sinning when I got saved. I know somebody's like, oh, bless God, why are you doing in the pulpit then? Did, did, did you, when you got saved? No. We, now we turned a corner. I'm not embracing sin anymore. I'm not any, any longer looking at sin as it's my lifestyle. That's my identity. We talked about identity a while ago. My identity is in Christ. But there's still times that I need a refreshment. There's still times I need this whole sanctifying thing. By the way, the, the, when this word here, when he uses it, sanctify, he used it two or three times there, it, it's meaning to, to, to make something holy, but to set it apart for, and here's the, the, the language that caught my attention, for special use. For special use. Do you realize tonight, Christian, that God has set you apart for special use? And I mentioned this last night, too many times we've just reduced this thing down to where our life's all about the things that we don't do. Man, don't cuss, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't chase women that do. Don't, don't do any of that stuff. Again, good Christian now. No, no, no. What about... The gospel, what about soul winning? What about holiness? What about separation? What, I mean, things that are just like, oh yeah, I remember those. I can't follow Jesus and stay where I'm at. I can't follow Jesus and not be a soul winner. I can't follow Jesus and not deal with sin. Amen fact being there there is no sin that is trivial to God no sin that's trivial to God we might excuse it 
We might play around with it. God hates it. And the closer you get to Him, you'll not just love what He loves, you'll hate what He hates. This is the picture of revival. The church getting cleaned up. You say, well, and I've heard people say this. Well, preacher, you know, revivals, they don't last. Well, neither do showers. But you took one today. I hope you took one today. Amen. Every day. Why? Because as I go throughout my day, I just kind of get some of the world on me. I just kind of get some nasty on me. And by that next morning I get up, I'm like, bless God, I don't want to take off nasty. I want to take off clean. Amen. This is why we have special times called revival. We don't do this every month. We don't do this often in most churches every year. These are special times to say, God, we're sitting aside sometimes uninterrupted, unhindered for the purpose of, God, we just got to get clean again. We got we some forsaking and some confessing to do. God, I'm crying out. Clean me up. You might need revival if church is no longer a celebration. You might need revival if you're outwardly faithful and inwardly filthy, but you also might need revival if your heart is no longer hungry for heaven. I want you to look down in verse 7. It said then they, they had shut up also the doors of the vestibule. They put out the lamps and, and, uh, and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy places to the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, and He's given them up to trouble, to desolation, to jeering. As you see with your eyes, for indeed, because of this our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our daughters and sons and our wives are in captivity, and now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. You see, there's this picture that's developing here in this that Worship had a lot of components for them. Uh, worship had a, and I'm, boy, I'm thankful for grace. I'm thankful that Jesus tore the veil. I'm, I'm thankful that we have access to Him. I don't have to have a priest that I go to. And I'm thankful, bless God, He didn't make me a priest, okay? That you had to come to me. Because I'd be ornery. I just would. If, if I had the ability to, to just do what, I'd zap some of y'all just for being nasty at times. Poke you a little bit, okay? When you're getting ready to sin, right before you did, you know, you know, I get you. But you don't have to come to me. You don't have to go to pastor to, to have access to Jesus. These guys had a lot of hoops they had to jump through. But the picture was all, this is what's so good, all of this was pointing to Messiah. All of it, the, the burning of the incense, the showbread, everything that they did, all of this was pointing to Messiah that was coming. It was all a beautiful picture of Him. And I, just, I don't have time to explain all of it, so it, it, that's what's happening. When I say your heart's no longer hungry for heaven, it comes out in that we no longer have an appetite for the things of God. That's why we need revival. Revival creates in us a hunger and a desire to say, I want to be back making priority out of the things of God. Now, I'm not just talking about showing up to church. I'm talking about you'll sing different. I'm talking about you'll pray different. I'm talking about you'll give different. I'm talking about you'll serve different. You won't any longer be one of those, those that just walk around in the lobbies of the church with the grumble gut. You know what I'm talking about. Some folks just walk through the church. This is well, what's wrong? And you just, just get in this mode. You just, just constantly. It's griping. I mean, just griping. Just, just nasty about it. You might need revival. Church has become about another job. Just a, another thing. Well, why are you up there? Your heart's no longer hungry for heaven. You see, when we filled ourselves so full of what the world has thrown at us, we, we no longer have an appetite for the things of God. Let me illustrate this way. I want you to think about your favorite food. 
whatever it is, okay? It probably ought to be like Little Debbie Christmas tree cakes. Amen. Or pecan pie. Something, you know, that the Lord would be pleased with. And, and so think about that. Whatever it is, okay, whatever it is. Um, if you just thought of green peas, that wasn't from God, by the way. That's, that's not God. Eat them all here, because ain't not going to be any there. All right? So think about that. You're, I mean, the thing that is your birthday meal. My family does that. On birthdays, you get whatever you want. Mama's going to cook it for you. Mine is brown beans, cornbread, and fried taters. Can I have a witness? Oh, hey, I'm a country boy, I told you. That's, that's my birthday meal, okay? I'm the only one in my house that gets all fired up about it, but I'm telling, oh, come on. Now, I want you to go with me to a, a smorgasbord somewhere. I'm talking about you, whichever one you like. It might be a Chinese buffet. It might be a... you know, you know, a golden corral. One of the, and you just ate. You just sat there and talked and ate and ate you know how when you leave one of them restaurants and i mean like you may have ate so much something come undone in there y'all know what i'm talking about you ever y'all okay yeah just i mean like hurt it's like i i may just lay down and die right here okay you're you're in bad shape now hang on i'm going somewhere with this somebody comes and they bring a fresh hot pecan pie and set it out in front of you. You're hurting. I'm talking about something come undone in there. And they brought your favorite pie out. Your favorite dish. Brown beans, cornbread, and fried taters. Sit it. That's your birthday meal, man. You know what you do? You go, oh. Man, maybe. Can we get a box? Can I get to that later? You see, what happened is, is you filled up on all the stuff that wasn't the best. And when the best was offered, you didn't have an appetite for it. Church, the reason we don't experience revival is because we come in full and fat and sassy. On the world's entertainment, the world's offer of peace, the world's offer of hope, the world's offer of all those things. And God sets before you His absolute best. And here's what we say, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. It's not that I don't want it, I just, I'm full. i got so much stuff going on. I, don't, I go to church, you know, revive, middle of the week. Are you, golly. Your heart's no longer hungry for heaven. Let me give you the last one. You might need revival if there's no longer any passion in your praise. No longer any passion in your praise. Jump with me over to verse 28. Same chapter. They've brought them back. They're beginning to worship. And it says, so all the assembly worshipped. That just grabbed my attention. You say, well, what for? The one little word, A L. Hell, all. He said, well now, hang on. You know, well, what does that mean in the Hebrew? You ready for this? Every blooming one of them. All of them. There ain't no hidden meaning here. They all worship. The whole assembly worshiped. The singers sang. The trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all, all who were present with him, they bowed and worshipped. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Israelites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. And they sang praises, you get you ready, with gladness. And they bowed their heads and they worshipped. Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now, that you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord, come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. So the assembly brought in sacrifices, thank offerings, and as many as were of willing heart brought in burnt offerings. Do you see the progression? They weren't worshiping. Somebody stood up and said, well, we're going to have to get back to church. 
They open up the doors. They repair the doors. They bring them in and say, hey, listen, let's don't come in here and start singing praises to God and y'all living so nasty. We're going to deal with sin right out of the gate. Let's recognize that which is wrong. Let's call it out. Let's name it. And by the way, you can do everything but that in a church and still be popular. But you name it, oh my soul. God names it. All throughout our Bible, He, he names it. There's, our, our culture screams at this, and the church is starting to scream at it too. Man, you condemn sin roundly, would you? Now, he's very pointed. If you don't like that, you sure won't like the writings of Paul. Paul would call out names. He, he would, could you imagine being in some of those meetings, and Paul says, hey, you know, Brother Ed, stand up. You've been a nasty man, a polecat and a scallywag. Repent, sir. You say, he didn't do that. Of course he did. Read his, his letters. Paul's saying Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. He, he's calling them to task. How different our churches would be if we just started saying, no, that's sin. We can't do that. We won't do that. We can't, we, we're just so divided in, in not just our nation, but even in our churches about this. And I'm just telling you, if we can't get it right on this area, We'll never have any passion in our praise. You know how to make a Baptist really mad? Sin differently than they do. Sin differently. Because then, then they can really be upset about your sin. Oh, bless God! <laughs> Some reason we get real, you know, kind of muddied on our language whenever we get after that. I can't believe she would. I can't believe he would. Well, what about you? Yeah, but I'm not doing that you see hezekiah understood they had to deal with sin hezekiah understood that there's gonna to have to be a longing in the heart of the people not just in the leader but in the heart of the people to say we're gonna to have to get back to worship and when they did holy smokes that's a hebrew phrase holy smokes they came back and got passionate they got happy. They're dancing and singing. And I know you're going, we're a Baptist church. We're distinguished. I, I just wish. I do. And I'm a Baptist through and through. I was Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. Okay? But I really wish we could just get a little bit more free. I do. It's okay to shout. It's okay to hoot and holler. Because here's the thing. Let me tell you what you Baptist people do. You do it everywhere else. You do. I go up at them Hawks game from time to time. I'm telling you, 70, 80,000 people in there screaming at the top of their lungs. I mean, they're hooping and hollering. They're grown men with painted bellies up there yelling about some dude that they don't even know running on fake grass across the fake chalk line with a dead pig under his arm and they're screaming and shouting and hooping and hollering and if he crosses said line, they will Bump one another. I mean, like jump up, high five, shouting, screaming, hooping, hollering, the whole mess, and come to church and sit like some old deadhead on Sunday morning. Oh, God, help us. And by the way, I'm not talking about things getting carried away, but let me just help you. We're not in any danger of that. I'm just saying. If we're not passionate about it, and we come in here and we sing and we pray, we praise, why under heaven would a lost world without the Holy Ghost of God living in them want to have anything to do with what we have? There'd be church members trying to bring a lost friend to church and griping about the church when they're doing it. I... I I pray he close your mouth like he did the lines for Daniel. Church, here's, here's just what I believe. I think we can have all the revival we want to have. We get an appetite for it. I think, I think God is m much more willing to send revival than we are willing to pay the price for it. It's going to cost us a little bit. You say it costs us, yeah. You can't stay like you are. I know here's what I find. I'm, I'm set myself included. I'm closing my Bible. I'm wrapped up. I'm done, okay? 
more often than not, we're more interested in watching it than experiencing it. Oh, how it'd be so awesome to see the Lord fall in this place tonight. We watch some folks get right with Jesus. They'd be so winners. They'd go out and just beat the bushes uh, tomorrow, trying to win everybody they can, invite them to church. They're excited. They've forsaken sin. But I'd rather just stay over here in my blue chair and watch that happen. Here's what I'm calling you to tonight. I'm calling you to an experience with the Lord Jesus called revival we begin to beg God to do something deep in us individually. We would begin to beg God tonight to, Lord, set me free from this sin that's holding me back. Here's the beauty of it. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us that if we'll confess our sin, He is faithful and just to not only forgive us of our sin, but cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good? Let's do this. Would you bow your heads?